hi. It's uh, always nice uh, to be back in North Dakota, even when it's 100 degrees colder than it is where I now live in Los Angeles. I think this is a picture's worth a thousand words. It says, I, I thought that was a figure of speech. All right, think about it a minute. I grew up in West Oak, North Dakota, right on the Canadian border. Uh, it, <laughs> and I'm an interventional cardiologist, or my dad would say, a glorified plumber. And I'm now the chief of cardiology at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Beverly Hills. It's a long ways from West Oak to Beverly Hills. And what I'd like to do today is talk about stem cell therapy. This is the headlines on the USA Today on January 30th. It highlights our temperature difference, and I think it also announces a new stem cell breakthrough. I've been working with cardiovascular stem cell therapy for the last 10 years. We've treated nearly 400 patients in Minneapolis, at the Minneapolis Heart Institute, or in Los Angeles. And so cardiovascular stem cell therapy, it's here today. It's a reality. But it's complex, and it's a very challenging process. And unfortunately, I don't think we always get the nuances. So there's considerable excitement about stem cell therapy. We live in a USA Today society. In fact, a USA Today online society. We get our information from sound bites, and stem cells are a perfect example. When I say stem cells, you think Democrat or Republican. You think left or right. And unfortunately, stem cell therapy has become a political dividing line with the focus on embryonic stem cells. This slide says, we're here to help you with your stem cell research. I'm a philosopher, and he's a politician. And unfortunately, that's what it's like when we first meet patients. We spend a lot of time navigating through the nuances and to get to the truth. Another example of this divide is what we should do with stem cell therapy. On one hand, you have very principled, outstanding basic science uh, physicians who think that we should only do stem cell research with embryonic stem cells and only in basic science laboratories, that we don't know enough yet to actually go into patients. On the other hand, you can pay $5,000 or $50,000 and go to Tijuana or Bangkok, do liposuction, take out the stem cells, two hours later they inject them and you'll be 10 years younger, your hair will grow, you'll have more energy, all your diseases will be cured, and sex will be better. <laughs> so we have far too much controversy about stem cells, and we have far too much hype. So this is hallelujah, someday you'll have hair again, but if the implication is that you'll get out of the wheel wheelchair and walk. And what I want to say is with stem cell therapy, it's like any other therapy. We need to do well-designed studies, we need to understand the risks, and we need to understand the benefits. So what I'd like to do today is to talk and go to where the substance beyond the sound bite. So what are stem cells? Stem cells are on specialized cells. They have two unique properties. They have the ability to self-renew or make copies of themselves over and over and over again. And the second, they have the ability to differentiate into specialized cells. And what they do is they serve as the body's natural repair mechanism. It's the way the body renews itself. Now, there's a, lot of, a wide variety of stem cells. So when you say stem cells, it can mean a lot of things. The first, there are embryonic stem cells, which is what the controversy is on, and we'll touch on that in a minute. The second, there's an interesting thing called induced pluripotent stem cells. What we're able to do now is we're able to take a cell in the body move it backwards to the point where it has all the properties of an embryonic stem cells. So in some ways, obviating the need for embryonic stem cells themselves. There's stem cells in cord blood, and then there's adult stem cells. All of you in here are full of stem cells. We have circulating stem cells in our bloodstream. We have stem cells in our bone marrow, stem cells that become red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets, stem cells that become bone and cartilage. And then we have stem cells in all the organs of the body. So there's stem cells in fat, in muscle. You, when you take out a biopsy for your muscle, it'll grow back and it'll stop growing. So it's a very controlled process. So what about embryonic stem cells? The, this is where the ethical controversy comes, and it becomes because they come from embryos. They come from the inner cell mass. 
So embryonic stem cells actually have the potential to teach us a lot about the body's way that the body uses stem cells. And so clearly there's a role, but as we just said, it may not be that the controversy needs to be where it's at. So do stem cells work? There's three parts to this question. The first is, of course they work. That's how we're here. When you cut your skin, it heals. Every week, you turn around your platelets. You have brand new platelets every seven days. If I take out half of your liver, your liver will grow back. And not only will it grow back, it'll stop growing, which again show, pull, shows you the complexity of the process. The ability not only to grow new cells, but to control that growth is a very important process. So what we're trying to do with stem cell therapy, our goal is to enhance the body's natural process of regeneration. That's what we're trying to do. So how are we doing? Well, first of all, we know that stem cells work in animal models. Clear cut. We know that we can multiple different stem cells, multiple different models. We can grow new blood vessels. We can grow new heart muscle. So we know that it works. But what about in patients? Are they effective in patients? We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. So how do stem cells work? This is another thing that's more complex, and we're learning more about it all the time. In the natural process, stem cells become the cells they're supposed to be. Stem cells for red blood cells become red blood cells. Stem cells in the muscle become muscle. But when we give stem cell therapy, it's, that's likely to be a very small part of the process. Very few of the cells we give actually become muscle or actually become blood vessels. What they do is they work, they do singling. So they increase growth factors, and they increase the use of endogenous or your own stem cells. It's what we call the paracrine effect. So what cell is the best cell? I love this question. It's asked at scientific uh, conferences all the time. The, it, the, it's like asking the question, what antibiotic is the best antibiotic? And the answer is, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to treat? So if I'm Joe, and I have severe blockages, that, and I'm no longer a candidate for bypass surgery or stinting, and I have terrible chest pain, and I can't even walk a block, what I need is to grow new blood vessels. So I want to use a cell that grows new blood vessels. On the other hand, if I'm Bill, and I had a heart attack 10 years ago, and my heart muscle is damaged, and it's scar tissue now, and I'm short of breath, so I can't walk a block because I'm short of breath. I don't need new blood vessels, I need new heart muscle. So the goal there is to give a stem cell that grows new heart muscle. And that's much more challenging. I think that's the holy grail for cardiovascular disease. So what is the evidence? What do we know so far? And what have we learned now in 10 years of clinical trials of actually putting patients in trials? An example here is from the JAMA, which is a, one of our major medical in literature. It was published a year ago. It was a study sponsored by the National Institute of Health. So we had 86 patients. Half of those got placebo. Half of those got stem cells. And they got the first generation of stem cells. So what we do is we put a needle in the hip. We take out the stem cells from the bone marrow and we process those stem cells. And several hours later, we inject them directly into the heart muscle. So it's sort of the first generation of stem cell. And what we found in this, in this study was the heart function improved by 2.9%. So your heart muscle pumped better. A modest improvement. The other thing we know from using stem cells is they're very safe. There's now thousands of patients who've got the first generation of stem cells. It's very safe. But we learned something very more important from that, and that is the improvement was related to the age of the patient, so the older patients didn't do as well. And second of all, it was related to the quality of the stem cells in that person's stem cells. And this is a very important issue that we'll go, and, and as we go forward in the next 10 years, it's a very important one. It's shown in this slide. This is 29 different patients where we take out their stem cells and we grow them. You'll notice that two patients did great. They have normal stem cells. They're in the blue. Everything works perfect for them, just like healthy, normal people. But other people, look at patient number six, didn't grow at all. Those are really bad stem cells. And I think it points it out, what you see here, is as we age, the number of stem cells and the potency of the stem cells decline. And this is a mesenchymal cell, which is a very important cell that shows it's the same thing. 
So this is a very important issue that we've now learned. So what are these strategies to enhance cell therapy? As we go forward in the next 10 years, how are we going to get better? How are we going to make it better? So number one is we can increase the number of cells. So I give you 100 million cells. Now I give you a billion cells. Might work. Or I give it to you two or three times. Might work. It's one idea. What's the second one? The second one is to do selected cells. So if I want to grow new blood vessels, let's give you a cell that grows new blood vessels. That's called CD34 positive cells. And I'll show you the example in here. This is an example of the complexity of what we do with the study. So this was 167 patients, and these are all patients who have severe blockages that we can't fix. And they are still having chest pain despite all of the medical therapy we have, not candidates for bypass surgery, not candidates for stent. And we're keeping people alive longer. There's a lot of these people out there. So clearly an unmet need. If you can't walk to your mailbox, your quality of life is bad. You get admitted to the hospital. So a very important group of patients. And what we did was we gave one group got placebo, one group got low-dose stem cells, and one group got high dose stem cells. And in, I'm blinded, the patient's blinded, it's the way you have to do it. So there's no bias in the study. And it's an important part of the scientific process. And what we saw was the patients who got stem cells had a significant decrease in their chest pain. So six or seven episodes per week, that's a lot. That means now you can walk to your male glass. That means you can maybe play golf. And that changes your life. You also see the placebo patients got better. So just being in a clinical trial makes you better. And what we also saw, the same thing, is on the right, the patients who got low-dose and high-dose stem cells could walk farther, more than a minute farther on the treadmill. So very important process, very important step that we can show that stem cells actually probably promote the growth of new blood vessels if you use selected cells. So what's the third way? A third way is you take out the bone marrow, the first generation of stem cells, and you grow it for a few weeks. You increase the good cells, you decrease the bad cells, if we can figure out the good cells and the bad cells. And then you inject it in the patient several weeks after you've processed it, after you've made it stronger bone marrow. This was just an, uh, a, a headline in the Minneapolis Star Tribune just several weeks ago about a new study that's going to start in the United States that's going to use exactly this process. Now, all of the first three involve your own cells, or what we call autologous. So I take out your cells and then use those. But what if we could do something different? And number four is, what if we could take a young, healthy donor, kind of like an Olympic athlete, take their stem cells, right, and then see if they can grow? Well, it turns out it works. Specific stem cells you can take from a young, healthy donor and you can give them to another patient, and there's no rejection. And we just did a study, a very important study, that's shown here. So you isolate the cells from a young, healthy donor. You give those cells. You culture them. So now they're like on the shelf. They're sitting there ready. When you come in with a heart attack, when you have a heart uh, uh, problems with your heart function, they're sitting there waiting for you. What a great idea. Did it work? There was no immune reactions. So it was important. The other thing we found is is that the patients who had the stem cells died less, had less heart attacks, needed less angioplasty and bypass. So they did better, a significant improvement in how they did. So this has moved forward, so now we've finished this phase, and now we're starting a new study with more than 1,000 patients. And if it confirms these results, then in fact, stem cells might be ready for you on the shelf when you or your neighbor or the person you golf with or the person you sit next to in church comes in. So what about the last one? The last one's a very exciting development. So the heart has less stem cells than other organs. It's really the, or it's really the heart has the least ability to regenerate itself, but it does. And what we found is we can take cardiac-derived cells, and we take a biopsy of the heart muscle, and we can grow those cells. We grow those for five or six weeks. And then we can take those cardiac-derived cells and then direct them directly into the heart muscle. And what you can see is, if you see on the top, that's the CD, the cardiac-derived cells. On the top, at baseline, you can see the white here where the 
where the arrows are. That's scar tissue from a heart attack. And six months later, you can see the white has gone away. The scar tissue went away. Whereas on the bottom, with the control patients, there's no difference. There was a big scar before. There's still a big scar. And if you look at that graphically, you can see it here. So this is a really well-designed study that at baseline, the amount of scar for the control patients didn't change. Absolutely the same. The amount of tissue that actually pumped didn't change at all. No difference. But the patients that got stem cells had a decrease in the amount of scar at six months and even more at 12 months. And more importantly, they had an increase in their functioning, showed we had the ability to actually regenerate muscle. So this is a very exciting finding, and this too now has moved into the new stage, a study that just started that's called All Star, and we're really looking forward to see if our results are confirmed with that. So where are we with stem cell therapy for cardiovascular disease in 2014? Well, we have significant patient needs. We've done a great job of keeping people alive. We've made major progress in the last 20 years, but we still have needs. There's patients who have severe blockages, are having chest pain, their quality of life is terrible. We have a significant number of patients with old heart attacks who have heart failure, the most important and most expensive problem in the United States today. And really, the end is only doing heart transplant or a, a cyst device. And if we could use cell therapy, it would make a major difference. And patients who have severe blockages in their legs. So there's huge patient needs. And there's significant promise. We know it's the way the body does it itself. We just want to enhance that process. And we know from the preclinical studies that it's positive. It can work. So what we need to do is very well-designed studies that actually teach us something and take us to the next step. And that's what we're trying to do, and that's why we want to put people in clinical trials. That's why you should be interested in science and trying to move the process forward. But it's challenging. It is not the slide that you get up out of the wheelchair and walk. It is not the hype. And people need to realize it takes time. It's a very complex process. It's a very complex process, and we need to understand it and do better. And there's significant challenges, but we can meet them. I have no doubt that we can meet them. So where are we now with cardiovascular stem cell therapy as now as we get close to Valentine's Day? Well, still not available at the florist, but getting closer all the time. So thank you for having me today. I appreciate it.